be seated.
Life here is a journey we walk by faith. And there will always be the mountains in our way. But right here in this moment, may our strength be renewed as we recall what God has done and how we've seen him move. If there's anybody here who knows he's faithful, anybody here who knows he's able, say amen. And if there's anybody here Yeah. 
Doesn't it look good to see this backdrop still here on the stage? Amen. I like that because it enables the entirety of the church to celebrate Vacation Bible School. We're so excited about what the Lord accomplished here. So let me say, I know it's been said a few times, but let me say thank you to all of you guys that made Vacation Bible School possible. Uh, regardless of what you did to pull that off, thank you. That's wonderful service, and it makes an internal impact, an eternal impact upon the lives of young people. Amen? So, but every good endeavor has to have some leaders. So I want to say this morning, thank you especially to Michael and Nicole Wolf. Would you give them a warm round of applause this morning? Amen. Thank you, Nicole and Michael, for all that you do and all that you did to make this weekend possible. As we were singing and worshiping and I was looking at the backdrop and looking through the congregation and seeing all of the, uh, I'm going to slide this forward a little bit, seeing all of the Vacation Bible School shirts this morning, I was reminded of an exchange that happens in Scripture in Matthew chapter number 19. I'm not preaching from this. I just want to read it to you. Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse number 13. The Bible says, Then they were brought into him, brought into Jesus, of course, little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and prayed and departed thence. Church, our children must be an important part of everything that we do in our day. Did you know that there's a world that's waiting and watching to uh, swoop in and to teach our children, to mislead our children, to redirect our children? As a matter of fact, uh, I'm sure you've noticed you would have to live under a rock not to, but there's even a, a large portion and a group who have taken God's symbol of promise, the rainbow, misappropriated it, and now we celebrate that for a whole month. Well, I want you to know I'm proud to be a Christian this morning. I'm proud that God's promises are still true. I'm proud to say that Jesus still loves the little children and he loves you and I and there's hope for us in him this day. So I'm so thankful for Vacation Bible School and all that it means, but don't lose sight of the fact that Vacation Bible School is merely an event in a program. And the program is that all year long, everything that the church does should have some aspect of reaching young folks with the gospel of Christ. Because if we don't reach them... If we don't teach them, I promise you, our world will. And it'll be a vastly different message. This morning, if you have your Bibles, I want you to find the book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. And today, Lord will, both in the morning and the evening service, I want to preach to the church today. So if you are here visiting with us we are so thankful that you're here and and i pray that uh, that god's going to speak to you through his word his word is living breathing it's sharper than any two-edged sword but uh, I, I want to to preach to the church and what i mean by that primarily the messages today are intended for those who have been born again for those who know jesus as their savior out of the book of colossians but you know, I'm, I'm reminded that God can take any portion of His Word and use it however He sees fit. Amen? I, I learned that as a young preacher boy. I, as a matter of fact, I pastored before I was married. And I, I preached a series on marriage as a single man. What about the audacity? And I, I preached that on a Wednesday night, or in a series of Wednesday nights. And I remember one particular Wednesday night that we had a young man that came. He wasn't married either. He was just a teenager, and he got saved through that sermon and that service that had nothing to do from my perspective of salvation. But from God's perspective, He uses His Word. And His Word is sharper than a two-edged sword. And I believe that this morning, 
God has a message for us here. Colossians chapter number 1. I want to preach on the subject, Paul's prayer for the church. Paul's prayer for the church. If you're able to do so, stand with me out of the honor of the reading of God's Word. Maybe you've wondered, what is it that the apostle would pray for the church? What is it that, that maybe Paul would, would pray for us? Well, we're able to see that right here in his letter to the Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, and we'll start reading in verse number 9. Before we do so, church, can you say amen? amen. Can you say praise the Lord? Amen. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah? And now glory. glory. Amen. Here's what the Bible says. Colossians chapter 1, and verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord and to all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power and to all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray together this morning. Father, we do love you and we praise you and we give you honor and glory due you this day. And Father, I ask you for that which cannot be borrowed, for that which cannot be bought, but Lord, I do beg for the anointing. Lord, the anointing that makes the preaching of your word easy, and Lord, the anointing that allows me to preach your word with boldness. And Father, I ask you for just a few minutes, just a few minutes of, of the attention span of this congregation, and Father, I pray you would accomplish your purpose in us. Father, I pray that you would give me clarity of mind and clarity of tongue. Father, I pray that I would articulate your word in a way that's glorifying to you, edifying to your people, convicting to those that are out of your will, comforting to those who are going through periods of difficulty and tragedy and heartache. Father, I know that there's many such situations represented in this congregation. Lord, there's others that are... Uh, that are represented through the airwaves and through uh, the various forms of media that we use in order uh, to project your message. And Father, I pray for each and every one of these situations. May your word accomplish its purpose. And Lord, may I as your servant be hid for just a little while behind your cross. Lord, I pray that folks wouldn't see me or hear me, but Lord, may they hear from you. Father, would you take the feeble words of, uh, of myself, uh, who, uh, myself who is is just, Lord, finite and fickle and frail and all those things, and, Lord, accomplish what only you can do. Lord, I pray the prayer of John the Baptist. I want to decrease, and I want you to increase. I pray these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Prayer is a powerful thing, isn't it? As a matter of fact, it was Sidlow Baxter who said this. He said, Men may spurn our appeals... They may reject our message, oppose our, our arguments, despise our persons, but they are helpless against our prayers. I love that statement. And I don't know about you, but one of the most humbling, encouraging, uplifting, building up experiences that I have is when someone says to me, I am praying for you. It's encouraging to me. I mean, it's a simple statement, isn't it? Hey, I'm praying for you. Hey, I was thinking about you this morning, and I lifted you up in prayer. It's a simple statement. I think it's an act of service that all of us in this room that we can carry out, and I want to encourage you that prayer is not the last thing we can do. Prayer is not the only thing that we can do, but child of God, prayer is the very best thing that we can do. There was John Bunyan who said, if you run from God in the morning, you'll scarcely catch up to him any time throughout the day. We find that we are often powerless as believers because we are simply prayerless. 
It was Martin Luther, the great reformer, who said it this way. He said, pray as if everything depends upon God, then work and exercise your faith as if everything depends upon you. Here the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. He's writing in the early A.D. 60s during his first Roman imprisonment. The Apostle is under house arrest. And he's writing to this church in Asia Minor. We find that Colossae is going to sit in the Lycus Valley, about 100 miles east of Ephesus. And what we find that the Apostle is going to write to them with some specific aims and goals in mind. He wanted to correct some misunderstandings that they had, and he wanted to fortify them against the theological and the philosophical attacks that this particular church was facing. And this particular church was facing the attack of syncretism. They lived in a day that ideologically was not that different from where we are right now. You see, we live in a day where folks tell us we should literally be syncretists. Now, what they mean by that is they mean that regardless of what your religious conviction is, as long as you live out that religious conviction, we're all going to the same place, just getting there different ways. Now, this is not universalism, although it has a flavor of it, doesn't it? I mean, these folks who promote this syncretism, they say you have to have some sort of a religious conviction. You have to fulfill it, whatever that conviction is. And then at the end of the day, we're all going to the same place. And then the, there's a Greek word for that, which is baloney, because Jesus said that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no man coming to the Father but by him. So the Apostle Paul wanted to combat this ideology of syncretism. And by the way, we are inundated in our world with that same ideology that tells us we need to back up on our convictions. We need to press down the teaching and preaching of biblical doctrine. That's what ushered in the, the golden age of ignorant theology. I'm not going to preach theology. I'm not going to teach theology. My people don't need theology. Well, if you noticed in the bulletin this morning... Anytime that you and I talk about God, guess what we're doing? We're engaging in theology. So it's not a question of whether or not God's people. And listen to me, it's not a question of whether or not God's entity, which is the church, is engaging in theology. The question is, are we engaging in good theology? And the Apostle Paul wants to make sure that the church at Colossae understands that syncretism is not a path we should be heading down. But the church at Colossae also was inundated with another theological slash philosophical ideology. It was that of Gnosticism. Gnosticism wore many different hats. It had many different shades to the totality of its belief system. But in essence, they, they believed that matter was bad. They believed that, that, that Jesus wasn't truly God in the flesh, that, 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 he could, that God would never become flesh because anything that mater was material had to be bad. They also believed in a form of elitism, and they believed that, that only a certain group had the knowledge, if you will, had experienced the enlightenment, that, that it had been revealed unto them this certain select group was all that, that had this power and this knowledge, and they were the ones that held all that is true. And the Apostle Paul is going to combat that in this letter to the church at Colossae. As a matter of fact, no Christology is complete without using Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Because in verses 15 and 16, the apostle reminds us about Jesus, that he's in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him, and for him. So not only is the Lord Jesus Christ active in creation, but notice the purpose and the direction of creation is to glorify and to honor, to obey, to worship, um, to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul, in verse 15, he tells us he's the image. It's the Greek word icon there. In, in essence, when you see Jesus, you see all that God is. And the letter to the church at Colossians 
This particular letter, where we find ourselves this morning, it is what we might call Christocentric, or it's centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. And did you know that the church of the living Lord must return to a place that we center on Christ? Did you know that? I mean, it's not merely about the color of pews or the size of a building, big or small. It's not about the personality, flamboyant or dull, of the one who's in the pulpit. It's not in the speed of the songs that we sing or the age of the songs that we sing. It's about being centered on He who was, who is, and who is to come. And Paul's prayer for the church is to usher us down that path that we come to this sort of understanding. It's interesting when we think about prayer, William Barclay in his book, Prodigals and Those Who Love, here's what he said. He said when we pray, we must remember three things. Number one, the love of God that wants the best for us. So Barclay, Barclay says that, that God's love always desires the best for us. And then he says, number two, the wisdom of God knows what is best for us. So be sure you're tracking with Barclay this morning as I'm sharing this. He wants us to understand as we pray that the love of God in our life, that God always wants the best for us. But then he reminds us the wisdom of God knows what's best for us. How many times have you been in the valley of decision? How many times have you been in the furnace of difficulty and you don't know? You don't know what to do. You don't know where to go. You don't know which way to turn. And, and William Barclay reminds us that it is the wisdom of God that always knows what's best. But then thirdly, he said, when we pray, must we not only remember that the love of God wants what's best for us, and secondly, that the wisdom of God knows what's best for us, but thirdly, the power of God can accomplish what is best for us. And here the church at Colossae seems like they're in a very difficult circumstance. And they seem like they're facing insurmountable odds. But we're going to be reminded, and they are going to be reminded, that he who holds them, that he who is in them, is greater than he who's in the world. That God's word is not limited. And his word is not void. And his power has not been discounted. And that his voice has not been muted. And that his reach has not been shortened. And that his glory has not been detained. And that his power will always be revealed as we follow him. So notice a few things this morning. What does the Apostle Paul pray for the church? Well, number one, Paul prays that we will grow. Paul prays that we will grow. I've been a Baptist all my life. I've said I'm Baptist born and Baptist bred, and when I die, I guess I'll be Baptist dead, okay? I can talk about us because I am one. And many times I've heard folks accuse Baptist preachers of saying or preaching or teaching that you can live however, as long as you've had some experience with Christ, you can live however, and then you're going to go to heaven, everything's good. I've never heard a Baptist preacher, preacher teach that. As a matter of fact, now we do believe and we do teach because the Bible teaches and proclaims the validity of eternal security. We are secure in Christ. And I'm not trying to be ugly about that. Matter of fact, I'm not trying to debate that because I don't believe personally that biblically that's even a debatable question. The, the Bible teaches it. The Bible teaches it in a myriad of places. There's nothing you and I could do to earn our salvation. Our salvation is not guaranteed by ourselves. It is not guaranteed by our works. It is, not, it is not guaranteed by our faith. But now it is, our faith massages into it, doesn't it? Our faith helps us to grow. Our response and obedience helps us to get further down the pathway of faith, if you will. But there's nothing you could do to save yourself. And understand this morning, if you have been saved, you're not keeping yourself and you're not holding yourself but he who saved you he's holding you and I rejoice in that the apostle Paul understood that well he says he's a chief among sinners I echo that how about you 
You see, I understand this morning there's nothing good in me outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but Paul prays here that we will grow. And assuredly, we must grow in our faith. You see, salvation is not the finish line. It is the starting gate. It's not about how fast the horse leaves the gate, but it's where the horse finishes the race. And you and I are in the race of faith. As a matter of fact, even this same apostle uses that analogy to describe our faith walk. He says that he had finished his course, that he had won the race. He said, I've finished my faith. You remember, he's, he, he's fought the good fight. He's finished that course that was set before him. And he teaches us that we are called to grow. There's a phrase in our day, maybe you've heard it, the phrase, ask a question. The phrase says this, is the juice worth the squeeze? You ever heard that? You ever heard that? Is the juice worth the squeeze? And I believe that's where we come, even though we probably don't ask it that way. In reality, that's the question we ask when we contemplate spiritual growth in the life of the church. Uh, this was... Uh, brought out to me and I was reminded of it in reading the book The Lost Art of Disciple Making by Larry Ems. Larry tells a story in that book about one spring that him and his family were traveling from Fort Lauderdale to Tampa. And this trip coincided with the peak of the, of the orange fruit becoming ripe. And he said everywhere you look you could see orange trees hanging with oranges. They stop at a diner. Both sides of the road from the diner, orange trees. He walked into the diner and he said every booth and every table had a bowl of oranges to decorate and to provide, I guess, some sort of appetizer. He said as he looked across the, the diner, every plate that came out from the kitchen had orange slices as garnishes. He ordered some eggs and then he ordered some orange juice to go with the eggs. And the waiter said, I'm sorry. We do not have any orange juice because our machine is down. Brother M said he sat there for a second scratching his head, looking through the window, seeing thousands of oranges hanging on trees. He looked across the diner. He sees all the oranges in the bowls on the table. He looked at all the slices of oranges garnishing the plate, and he said it hit him immediately. We are surrounded by oranges. There's thousands and thousands of gallons of orange juice out there, but somebody has determined that the juice is not worth the squeeze. I'm afraid that's where we are in the church in America. We're surrounded by ways to mediate the message. As a matter of fact, today there's probably folks in, in numerous states, multiple nations watching this service right now. Many of you have your favorite preachers. You watch them on YouTube or on Facebook or whatever means that might be. Many of you receive weekly emails of devotions and encouragements and, and teaching. Uh, many of you have shelves full of books and we have programs full of resources that pour into our soul. But yet we live in a day that the church is feeble and the church is weak and the power of God seems to be displaced. And I wonder if we've not come to a place in God-blessed America in the midst of resources everywhere that we forgot that the juice is worth the squeeze. Paul prays that they will grow. Now watch. My introduction took much longer than what I intended, so I'll try to preach fast, okay? Look at what he says here. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to... Pray for you. Since they heard what? Well, since they heard verses 4 through 8. Look what he says in 4 through 8. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is coming to you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you. Since the day we heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Paul says, since we heard that you guys are safe, folk, 
since we heard that, that you guys are walking in relationship with Christ, he says, we've prayed for you. Now, who's the we? It's Paul and Timothy. Verse 1 tells us that. Paul and Timothy has prayed for this group. Paul's prayer for the church here. What does it mean that he has not ceased to pray? Does it mean that Paul prays 24-7, 365? No, but it means that every day when Paul seeks the face of God, guess what he's doing? He's lifting up the church of Colossae. And friend, the church of Higher Ground Baptist Church, you're in a period of transition. I've said this many times, leading up in the, the last couple of months. And it's imperative that in times of transition that we not only crawl into the Word of God and, and fervently seek the will of God, but we must also... We must also, friend, pray for God's blessing and God's leading and God's direction and God's protection upon the body. And Paul here prays for growth. Notice, we do not cease to pray for you. Notice what they pray. And desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will. The word here, filled, it can mean a couple things. First, it means to be filled to completeness. So he's saying the capacity is entirely full. I filled up the gas tank of my truck this week and ouch. $107.50 something cents. I tried to stop it on, I, I'm kind of OCD like that. I like to stop on an even number. How about you or, you know? But listen, when it's almost $5 a gallon, you can't stop it there, can you? So it run over before, you know, it was like $107.50 and some change. $107.56 or whatever. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? But I, I, I pull out and I look down and my gauge said full. And I was trying to keep a positive attitude and not be frustrated. So I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you that I have a full tank of gas. You know, here Paul is reminding us that his prayer for the church is that they might be filled with something. Now, catch this. This word here for filled can also mean to be under control of or to be tied to. Now, you do understand this, right? You do understand that, that uh, hey, uh, Pastor Ronnie, are you listening? Because you need to hear this. When there's no gas in the tank, there's no go, right? No petro, no go-go. Are you with me? It's got to be filled up. It, it has to have some fuel in it before it's going to run and before it's going to function. And Paul's prayer is, here is that it be filled up, that it be complete. And this word can also mean to be under the control of or to be tied to. Thirdly, it can mean filled to the point that it's overflowing. So you get the picture here. The Apostle Paul is praying that the church at Colossae would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. That means that, that they would be filled with knowing what God wants for them, with knowing why God had called them, why God had saved them, why God was blessing them, knowing what God was doing in the midst of their life. Now notice he goes on to say, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You see, wisdom is not knowledge. Wisdom is knowing how to use knowledge. There's many folks who have knowledge, they've engaged in the intellectual pursuit of the truths of the faith, but yet they do not have the spiritual wisdom or the spiritual anointing to rightfully appropriate, to designate, and to utilize that intellectual knowledge. So notice, he prays that they would have spiritual knowledge of the will of God that this wisdom and spiritual understanding would follow. You see, in Matthew chapter 19, the disciples there, they don't have spiritual knowledge. They don't have spiritual understanding. In their mind, why would we, why would we, uh, why would we inundate the Master? Why would we bother the Master? Why would we upset Jesus with all of these little children who are running into them? But Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me. And that's the day, that, and that's the place. Not only is that the day, but that's the place that the church in America today we better get back to. Because the world's educating our children. The world is teaching our children new and foreign and vulgar vocabularies. Our world is teaching our children that which is perverse is normal. While we live in a world that seems to be, uh, seems to be engaged in mental health like never before, we live in a world that tells us that mental illness is normal. 
We live in a world that tells us that, that acts and desires and certain things that are contrary to the word and will of God, which I believe, and you can take it or leave it, get mad at me if you want to, but things that are indicative of a mental illness, that they are normal and they should be pursued. Paul says, I want you to grow. And church, I'm trying to tell you this morning that the juice is worth the squeeze. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 said it this way, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. 1 John 5, 20 said it this way, And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him, that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Not only does Paul pray we will grow, but secondly, Paul prays that we will go. Look at what he says in verses 10 and 11, that ye might walk worthy. Do you see that? The, the New Testament uses the word walk to delineate a pattern of life. And, and how, whatever the normal pattern of one's life is, that's the direction they're walking. And here, God calls us to not only come to a place that we grow in our faith, but then Paul says, I'm praying that you embark upon a journey where you're walking out your faith and you're living it. Now, he uses an interesting word here. Notice what the text says, that you might walk worthy. Do you see that? The word worthy is the Greek word there, oxios. It, it literally means in relation to or to an equal weight. Does that make sense? Here, the apostle says, I'm praying that you would walk in a manner that is worthy, that is an equal weight to the grace and to the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, let me just explain this to you. Here's what Paul says. Paul says the relationship to our spiritual walk is directly tied to our spiritual growth. So I'm not telling you this morning that, that you're not saved if you're a carnal Christian. If you never engage in things of discipleship or if you never ask your question, your, the question, what's the will of God for your life, I'm not saying you're not saved. I would say you're probably not saved, but I'm never going to make that determination. But here's what I will say. I will say that the Scripture testifies to us here that there's going to be a relation. He's praying and encouraging us that we walk worthy in equal value to an equal weight of how we understand the glory and the goodness of God. Notice that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. May I just say something that this morning? If you will pursue what pleases God, I promise you it will please you. But here's what we do in our fallen state. You, you know that we're flesh, right? And that comes with many hindrances. And one of the hindrances of our flesh is flesh likes to rule. Flesh likes to be right. Flesh likes to have its own piece of the pie. And, and flesh says, go after this, and when you get it, oh, it's going to be okay. That, that will sum it up. That, uh, when you get that, everything else is going to be okay. How many of you have ever been there and discovered that that's not it? Huh? You know what I'm talking about. You, you remember when you had $10 in your piggy bank and you said, boy, if I can get to $100 in my piggy bank, everything's going to be okay. And you got there and that $100 didn't do anything for you any more than the $1 did. You see, there's no fulfillment in those things. So Paul's prayer here, here is that we will go, we will embark upon a, a walk of faith that is in direct relation to the goodness and the glory of God, and then that pleases God. And I promise you, Christian, if you please Him, it'll become pleasing to you. And then he says, being fruitful in every good work, producing fruit. You know what that means? and increasing in the knowledge of God. You see it there again. There's, there's that growth. Once you embark upon it, it just comes up time and time and time again. Churches are a mess. Do I have to tell you that? I mean, they blow up, they break up, they dust up. Some of them are planted and they push up for a little while and then they blow up all again. You know why? Because most of us that fulfill the church, we act like children. 
As a matter of fact, what we ought to do in the church is all of us should spend some time in the nursery. And we should watch little Johnny and little Bobby playing together. No, this is mine. No, this is mine. No, it's about me. Uh, but, but Johnny, you're not playing with that. Let Bobby have it. No, this is mine. Am I telling you the truth? You see, many times we have folks who fill our pews, who fill our pulpits, who fill leadership positions, who are ultimately babes in Christ. They are not growing. They are not going. And as a result, it's not long to everything. What does Paul say here? What's he saying to the church at Colossae? You remember how I started? Christocentric. Christ-centered. It has to be all about Christ. And when He is first and when we are last, when it's about what pleases Him, not what pleases us, then guess what? That will become pleasing to us and fulfilling to us. John chapter 15 verse 8 said it this way, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Is the juice worth the squeeze? Yes. You see, you remember what, what Brother Eames was telling us about. The, the, the waitress was used to going to a machine that was hooked to a, a jug and a jug filled with concentrate and pushing the button and the juice comes out. Oh, but it, it don't compare to fresh squeezed, does it? How many of you still do fresh squeezed orange juice? It's about what I thought. How many of you remember when mama or grandmama did fresh squeezed orange juice? All right, thank you. You know what amazed me about that the first time I ever saw fresh squeezed orange juice? It amazed me how many oranges that it took to get the glass of orange juice. I really would have thought there was more juice in the orange than there was. And it, it amazed me how that you have to, you know what I'm talking about, those old juice, you push and you push and you push and you push and you go through two or three oranges and you have a glass of orange juice. Oh, but it tastes like, like so wonderful. It's so fresh and it's so sweet with the hint of the tartness and, and you, you just have this, your, your taste buds are just overwhelmed with the goodness of the juice. Is the juice worth the squeeze? Yes. Paul prays that we... We'll grow. He prays that we will go. But look here, thirdly, he also prays that we'll show. Look in verse 12. He says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. We are called to show our thankfulness to God. And we are, we're called as believers to reveal where we are in our spiritual walk. Literally here, he reminds us that it is God who hath made us meet. Literally, He has qualified us. He's qualified us. He, he says, you can do this. If you're a golf fan, one of the, not the greatest in my opinion, but one of the greatest golf tournaments in our nation is right around the corner. It's called the U.S. Open. Do you know why the U.S. Open is so great? It's so great because anyone can participate. Now, the chances of you or I getting all the way to the tournament's rare. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, you have to have a certain handicap to even participate in a sectional. You have to pay $300. And if you do not play within 10 shots of your handicap, you will get a letter saying you can't try again for 10 years. So don't run out here trying for the U.S. Open. But in theory, it's the greatest tournament in the world because anyone can participate. And here we find that, that in order to make it to that Thursday when the first tee ball is hit in the U.S. Open in the actual tournament, all of those folks who made it through their regionals and through their sectionals and through their state qualifying, all of those folks, they've come to a place and their name is on the list because they are qualified. And here... Here the apostle reminds us that you and I as children of God, guess what? We've been qualified by God. My name shouldn't be there. My face shouldn't be there. His presence and His power shouldn't be here. His forgiveness shouldn't be in my life. But God the Father has qualified us for that. Aren't you thankful, church? And Paul's prayer is that the church at Colossae, and I believe the church of today would, would, would bear that out and would show it. Colossians 3.15 said it this way, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, 
to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. 1 John 3, 2 said it this way, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There's coming a day we're going to see him as he is. I don't deserve that, neither do you, but God has qualified us as his children. He said, come on, son. Come on, daughter. You can go with me. Then lastly, not only does Paul pray that the church would grow, and does Paul pray that the church would go, and does Paul pray that the church would show, but lastly, Paul prays that the church will know. There's something he wants us to know here, and then I'm done. Look at what he says. He says in verse 13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and has translated us, oh, I love that, translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. You see, there's a contrast in this passage between light and darkness. Paul reminds us, we at one time in our lostness, we were in darkness. That's why we stumbled. That's why we were perpetually in a, in a disarray. That, that's why there was difficulty. That's why there's heartache. That's why there's the void of peace. And that's why there's no understanding of even the presence of pain. Because we just wander around in darkness in our lostness. But in Christ, we're delivered from it. And we need to know that. We need to know that He's translated us. He's, he's transitioned us, if you will, into the kingdom of His dear Son. And we need to know what that means. He says in verse 14, In whom we have redemption. We're redeemed in Him, church. Through what? Through His blood. Not just through an act. Not just through this or that. A pastor friend of mine called me this week, and the first thing that came out of his mouth, he said, he said, I need you to forgive me. And my first thought, no offense to anyone, but I thought, this is weird, this is not confession, I'm not a Catholic priest. And then he went on to tell me it was just something foolish. It, it wasn't anything real serious, although the tone of the conversation first started out very serious. Do you understand that you and I do not have the power to forgive one another? Maybe you heard about the, the inebriated man who comes stumbling up to the preacher and said, Hey, preacher, you remember me? You remember me? You saved me in that meeting, such and such. And the old tale goes that the, the preacher looked at him and said, Yeah, you look like one I've saved. Because you and I can't save each other. If God would give us that power, I would run through the streets of the world. Save, 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 wouldn't you? But God's determined that we're only qualified through an understanding of the sacrifice of His Son. That we're only qualified by, by coming to a place that we understand that we are sinners and that God's grace is freely given unto us. Redemption, redeemed, to be made new. It comes through the blood, even the forgiveness of sins. I love this because of the plural. Now, I understand that sin in general is singular. You understand that? Theologically, we call that homardiology. Sin singular. All sins against God. We've sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't know about you, but I've committed sins. And Paul reminds his readers, he reminds his listeners, and he reminds us today that through the blood of Jesus is the forgiveness of sins. And church, we need to know that. Again, the answer to our world, to our broken world, is the gospel. It's only the gospel that says the broken can be put back together. It's only in the gospel that says the crooked can be made straight. It's only in the gospel that says the wayward can come home. It's only in the gospel that says that the lost can be found. And those plunged in darkness can receive the light of Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 said it this way, for this is good and, acceptable, good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time.